Well, hey, good morning, church. How we doing? Good. Well, hey, welcome to Father's Day at Propel Church. My name is Nick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and it's such a honor and a privilege to get to be here with each and every single one of you this morning, and I hope that the dads out there are having a great time getting to celebrate uh, with your family. And here's one of the things that I realize uh, about fathers and, and about men is, men, you don't like to just be given something. You like to compete for it. You like to win it. You like to feel like you've earned it at the end of the day. And so before we get into the message, we've got some giveaways that we wanted to do. But I thought, how about we make you earn a gift card to Home Depot or to Lowe's? And so if you're a dad in the room and you want to be uh, capable of winning a prize, would you stand to your feet this morning? Awesome. Couple guys in the room. Right, you get one of them to stand up and they're like, he's not going to be me. So here's what I want to do. I want you to find another man in the room and I want you to pair up and we are going to have the ultimate dad rock, paper, scissor contest. Now, dads, here's what I want you to know. We don't do none of this rock, paper, shoot stuff, right? It's one, two, three, shoot. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to do one round and then the loser is going to sit down. After that, uh, you'll find another person who's won. And when we get down to two people, you're going to come up to the left side of the stage and you're going to join me on stage. Sound good? All right, let's do it. Staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life. All right, if you won, if you won, come out to the end of your row and find one more person who won. All right, we got three over here. We got two over here. I don't know what to do about that. You got it. Rock, paper, scissors. All right, can I get the two winners to come up stage with me? Come on, can we give it up for these guys? All right, we're good to go. So, fellas, are you ready? Here's the rules. Best two out of three is going to be the winner. All right? You ready? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Can we give it up for these guys one more time? That's two. All right, here is the winner. There you go. Can we give it up for these guys one more time? All right. Well, hey, guys, uh, thank you so much for, for letting us do that to kind of kick off the, the message portion of it. Um, here's what I want to do today. Typically in church, um, there's this really weird stigma that, that happens on, on Father's Day. See, on Mother's Day, churches typically praise moms and you honor them and you do a really good job of telling them oh, how awesome they are and how well they do. And then Father's Day rolls around, and every man leaves the church feeling like he's just been punched 400 times in the face because the church likes to beat up on dads. Here's what I don't want to do today. I don't want to beat up on dads. I want to show you, I want to teach you some things in Scripture about what we have the privilege as men of God, as families, as parents, as, as fathers, as individuals, to model for the next generation, to model for those people who look up to us and who watch us. I remember growing up, role models played such an important role in my life and in the lives of the people around me. Because here's what we all realize, there are two types 
of role models. There are good role models and there are bad role models. And we've all had those from time to time. But one of the things that role models do is they shape the way in which we live our lives based on how they lived theirs. And here's what I know. Whether you believe it or not, in someone else's life, you are a role model. You set an example. You set a pattern, a way of living that someone else looks at and then models things after. They take bits and pieces of your life and they say, man, this is really great or this is really bad. I don't want to do this. And they say, hey, this is how I'm going to live my life because of it. And so what I want to do is I'm going to teach us a couple things on how to be a good role model based on um, a passage of scripture. That This isn't going to be a traditional approach to this passage of scripture because today we're going to talk about the father of our faith on Father's Day. His name is Abraham, and, and, and he was the father of faith because it took a lot of faith for him to believe that God could continue to love him after all the mistakes he had made. No, 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 that's not, that's not it at all. Abraham had a lot of faith because Abraham had a really big problem. But God had given Abraham a promise. He takes Abraham outside one night, and he says, Abraham, I want you to look at the stars in the sky. Now, Abraham's old. His wife is old. And he says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to give you more descendants than the stars in the sky. And this sounds really great. It would, it would be a great promise to the people around him. It would be a great promise to his neighbor. But Abraham has this issue where he doesn't have a son. And it's the one thing that they've been longing for, that they've been desiring for their entire Life is, is to have a child that their name would continue to go on even after them, and yet they can't get pregnant. But God gives him a promise that he's going to be a father of many nations, that he will have a son. And the promise of God was way bigger than the problem of infertility. And as Abraham pursued God, he messed up time and time and time again. And yet in that moment, one thing we find out about God is that God is a God who always keeps his promises. In fact, Abraham messes up a few times. We'll talk about that in a second. So if you've got a Bible, Genesis chapter 22 today, and if you don't have a Bible, here's what I would I, I say this all the time. We would be honored to give you a Bible free of charge. We have Bibles available in the lobby. You just stop by the information booth. You can get a Bible. It's free. Since we've launched Propel Church, we've given away over 100 Bibles. And those 100 Bibles have been given to people that maybe didn't have access to God's Word or they didn't even have a Bible that they could read and understand. And so it's all because of your generosity that we're even able to do that in the first place. Um, so it is just great to, to be a part of that and, and get to see what God's doing. I love that I have to purchase Bibles all the time because we keep running out of them. And so if you need them, get them because we'll keep buying them because it's important. You ready? Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. It says this, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. See, if you're going to have this value, this characteristic, he's the father of faith. If, if he's going to have that kind of value, values have to be tested. Otherwise, they're just really good ideas. A value is not something in your life that you can say, yes, I really believe in, but it never has any pushback to you. He, he, he says his faith was tested. Abraham, God called him. And yes, he replied, here I am. Isn't that such a great way to, to, to answer to God whenever he asks you, hey, hey, he, God wants to get your attention. I think a lot of times we get distracted and we miss out on hearing from God what God really wants to say. But then he says this in verse 2, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Now, there's going to be a ton of correlations in this passage that we're talking about today between uh, Abraham and Isaac, Isaac being Abraham's one son, and God and Jesus, God the Father, and Jesus being his only son. And, and we'll talk about that a little more in, in just a bit. But 
the very thing that Abraham's been waiting for, that he's been longing for, that he's wanted his entire life, that him and his wife have desired. I mean, his wife has, ha, gives birth at over 100. I mean, this is not something that's very common. And it's in this moment, after they've got to enjoy the promise of God for a few years, they've got to experience the blessing. It's at the dinner table every night as Abraham begins to pray over the food that he says, God, we thank you that you're a God who keeps his promises, and he gets to look at his son Isaac and say, you are the one who God promised us. And it feels so good as a, as a, as a parent to, to be able to look at him and just say, God, you're the one that we've been waiting for for so long. And yet God tells him, I want you to go sacrifice your son, your only son. And look what it says Abraham does. It says, the next morning, Abraham got up early and he saddled up his donkey and two of his servants and they went with him along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped some wood for a fire for a burnt offering and he set out for the place in which God had told him. I I've always wondered, every time I read this passage, I wonder what the dialogue was like with his wife. Like, did he tell her, like, hey, sweetheart, look, this is what God told me. You know, look, I'm just going to go, I'm going to sacrifice our son, I'm going to come back. Like, that, I don't feel like that conversation would go over really well. And so he's probably like, look, we're going to go camping, it's going to be great, you know, put the camper out with the donkey, HDTV, like it's going to be awesome. And, but, but anyways, they, they, they set out on this journey, and it says, on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance, stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. I never understood why he even took him if he was just going to leave him there. Anyways, keep going. <laughs> Abraham told the servants to, to stay there. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there and we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he carried the fire and the knife, right? God gives you children that they may work. Thank you, Lord. And so <laughs> as the two of them walked together, Isaac turned to Abraham and he said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Isaac's not stupid. <laughs> he says, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered and they both walked on together. They, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go. Abraham built an altar, and he arranged for the wood to be on it. Then he tied his son Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. Parents, could you imagine this moment? It's this gut-wrenching feeling as you may just wonder about the internal turmoil that Abraham must be facing as he ties his son up. And he lays him on the altar and he picks up the knife and he draws it back. And at the moment, at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, yes, he replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not hurt him or harm him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me, even your son, your only son. And then Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. I'll explain that in a little bit. Abraham named the place Yahweh Hihira, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, the people still uh, use that name as a proverb, say, on this mount of the Lord will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven and says, this is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your own son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond the numbers like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer cities of their enemies and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. So I want to give you four things that we have the opportunity to model. And the first one is this, is that you get to model obedience. 
Now again, Abraham is given his son Isaac, and, and he loves Isaac. I mean, Isaac is the promised one. Isaac is the one that he's been waiting for and he's been longing for. And it's in the moment that God says, here, I want you to give up your son. Yes, your only son. It is really interesting that time and time again in Scripture, it points out the obvious that this is his only son. It is the one he's been waiting for. There's got to be this turmoil. But what Abraham has learned time and time and time again is that God's way is better than his way. Because over and over and over again, Abraham tried to forcefully create the fulfillment of the promise that God had given him. You see this time in passages with Abraham as he is traveling along the road and his wife gets this idea. Hey, what if you did have a son? Look, look, I'm getting old and, and I can't really give birth, but we've got this servant that you can sleep with. Husbands, never a good idea to sleep with the servant. Just saying. And Ishmael is born. And you know what God says? Yeah, he's your son, but he's not the promised one. You tried to do this all in your own strength and in your own power, and because of that, he's going to be cursed. Because nothing that we do in our own strength is fruitful. It might produce temporary fruit. It might produce something that seems like it's of, of great weight and great value, but at the end of the day, it's worthless. And obedience is doing what God says, even when you don't understand why he said it. Abraham, in verse number two, as soon as he hears from God, and God says, I want you to go sacrifice his son, verse number three says that he gets up and he goes. He obeys God, even though he doesn't understand why in the world God would say it. I can look back to moments in my life in some of the most crucial points where uh, there were decisions that had to be made. And, and I can tell you that doing what God says, even when you don't understand it, always brings blessing on the outside. It even says at the end of the passage that nations and, 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 and generations after generations, all the people of the earth are going to be blessed. Why? Because he obeyed. There's something that God loves about obedience. Time and time again in the scripture, we see that God's heart thrives when we're obedient to him. It doesn't make God love us anymore. It just means that we're walking in alignment with the plan and the will that he has for us because you can't earn God's love or God's affection. We try that, and again, it's in our own strength, and it fails miserably every time. You get to model obedience to God. And parents, dads, what would it look like if you modeled obedience to your children? Obedience and allegiance to do what God says, no matter if you understand it or not. To pick up God's word and not just read God's word. James will say that, that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of it, that we would pick up scripture and we would read it with our kids and we wouldn't just teach them about how great God's word is. We would show them how to live it out in their everyday life and we would model what obedience to scripture and what obedience to God looks like even when we don't understand why he said it. There's blessing in that. Number two, you get to model what worship is. I've always thought that this passage is really Strange and a couple years ago, as I read this passage for the first time, I really had to wrestle with something that Abraham says because Abraham, as he's walking on the journey, and they say, Hey, we're gonna go, he says, Isaac and I are gonna go worship. Now, Isaac doesn't know this at the time, but Abraham has full knowledge that he's gonna go kill his own son, and yet he still identifies it as. As worship. And I was really battling with this. God, how is, how is killing somebody worship? And I understand you told him to do it. And, and I get that. And God spoke to me one night. And it was so clear. He said, worship is giving back to me what's rightfully mine. That worship is giving back to God what's rightfully his in the first place. 
See, Abraham was given Isaac. Isaac was created in the image of God. He was, <clears throat> he was of God. God gave him birth. He gave him life. He gave him breath. All of that was given to Abraham from God. Every good thing comes from God. And in sacrificing him, what Abraham is doing is he's not killing his son. He's returning him back to the one that he came from. He's giving back to God what was rightfully his in the first place. Abraham was not the owner of Isaac. He was the steward of Isaac. See, parents, if I could just challenge you, sometimes you desire a relationship for, for your kids to have such a strong relationship with God that you get in the way of them having a relationship with God. It's difficult, I get it, but if you would give back to God what's rightfully his, here's what I can promise you, God loves your children more than you love them. His heart for them beats more than your heart beats for them. He can count every hair on their head. He knows them by their name. He knew them when they were in your womb, moms. God loves your children way more than you love them. And if we would return to God what's rightfully his, we would thrive as followers of Jesus. And this doesn't just happen with, with children. This happens with things like our time. All of us have the same access to 24 hours in a day. And some of you don't believe that, right? Because you're busy. But what if you gave your time back to God? Paul talks about whatever you do, do it for the glory and the honor of God. What I've learned in just a few years of, of doing ministry and really trying to focus on cultivating and developing a, a healthy relationship with Jesus is that when I give God my time, he multiplies it. When I give God everything that I have, he takes it and, and he does things with it that I could never do on my own. It, it, it takes place in our finances. Scripture says that everything comes from God. That's what tithing is. That's what, that's what generosity is. It's giving back to God what's rightfully his. It's being obedient when you don't understand it, but it's giving back to God as an act of worship to say, God, because you gave this to me, I'm going to give it back to you as an act of worship to show love and affection to you. And ultimately with our lives, parents, some of you want a thriving relationship with Jesus for your kids, but you don't have one yourself. And the beginning point of that is to say, God, here's my life. Because he's the one that gave you breath. He's the one that gave you life. He's the one that loves you and is for you. And, and he desires for you to live in such a way that would honor him with everything that you have. To worship him, to give back to him what's rightfully his. Number three, you get to model Trusting God for provision. Trusting God for, for provision. It's really difficult to trust God sometimes. Can I just be honest for a second? Because the journey that he's called us to as believers is not a journey of sight. It's a journey of faith. And, and faith is the evidence of things unseen. And I don't know about you, but I like to see things. I like to, I'm a visual person. And so when I believe that, that God wants me to do something, I just want him to show me for it to fall out of the sky. Like if, if a burning bush happened to me, I would be pumped because I'm like, God, this is exactly what I needed. I can see it. It's tangible. I know it's you. If my Honda starts talking like in cars, like I'm going to know this is from God and I'm going to listen to it. But the journey that we get to live on is not one of sight. It's a faith. that We would walk by faith and not by sight. And in this moment, Isaac looks up at his dad as they're walking, and he says, Dad, there's something that we're missing. Now, I know we're going to go worship, and it's going to be awesome, but where's the sacrifice at? Because Isaac has worshipped with his father before. They've sacrificed things Together, it's, it's part of his family, their DNA, their culture, their makeup. Where's the sacrifice at, Dad? The focus is all on the what, what's right in front of us. But I love what Abraham says. God will provide. 
He didn't understand it. He didn't even know how it was going to happen. But what he knew from past experience is that God was a faithful God. And that God is a God who keeps his promises. And God didn't give him a son just to take away his son. God gave him a son as a promise that he would be a father of many nations. And he was going to bank on that promise till the day he died. And so he went out on this journey And they get up there and they get to the mountain. And you know what? Abraham goes to sacrifice his son and the angel stops him. And what happens? There's a ram caught in the thicket. It just popped up there. Now God orchestrated the whole thing. Because Abraham models for us that we do not trust in riches, but in he who richly provides. I wish we would be a church that didn't trust in our stuff, but we trusted in the fact that God was going to take care of his children. I want us to be a place where we can say, God, if we give you everything, we know that you're going to take care of us in the process. He models for us that trusting in God is not about if he shows up, it's about when he shows up. He has confidence in the fact that God is not going to kill his child because he says, we will go worship and then we will come right back. Now, we coming right back is not indicative of him going up and killing his son. It's indicative of God keeping the promise that he gave him. Because he didn't trust in stuff. He trusted in the one who is the provider of all things, who provided the stuff that he needed to still do the sacrifice as a replacement. And number four, you get to model a blessed life in Christ. Now look, this is an incredibly dramatic moment for Isaac. Now we would be totally remiss if we, if we didn't acknowledge the fact that he's laying on a table. His dad has just kind of lied to him from his knowledge at this point, laid him on a table, made him carry the stuff he was going to tie him to. (laughs) Isaac, I need you to build that altar over there. Oh, by the way, get on it. You know, I mean, he sets him up, ties him up, picks up a knife, and Isaac's watching his dad the entire time. They're making eye contact. Abraham's blood's kind of turning feels the sickness in the pit of his stomach, but he's going to be obedient to God. And he draws back the knife. And then the angel appears and says, hey, do not harm him. And although this was a traumatic moment for Isaac, he gets to look at his father and see what it would look like for someone to be completely devoted to doing what God says above all else. And not only that, he gets to hear God praise his father for the obedience that he had. So here's the last thing that I have for you is that blessing comes from withholding nothing from the one who gives it all. As we talk about Father's Day, Man, we would be missing out if we didn't talk about the fact that we have a loving heavenly father who did not spare anything, but he came to us. And just as the ram was the replacement for Isaac, See, Isaac didn't have to be slaughtered that day, not not because, uh, one, it was because of Abraham's obedience, but the sacrifice of Isaac would have only been a temporary payment for the, the punishment of sin because Isaac was imperfect. He had flaws. He had sin in his life. And so the replacement for Isaac, instead of Isaac being slain as Abraham's only son, God sends his only son as the perfect payment of sin, that by his bloodshed, we could be set free, free from bondage, free from sin. It's Jesus. Jesus is the replacement. And here's what I know about all of our lives is that we've tried to replace emptiness, try to replace anger, bitterness, frustration, 
lust, envy, greed. We've tried to replace all of those things with other things. Here's what I want to ask you if you do today. Would you accept Jesus as the replacement for your sin? That in him, your descendants could be blessed. I realize that some of you have had horrible fathers growing up. And, and some of it's probably not just your father. It was your father's father and your father's father's father. And it passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. You know the beautiful thing about Christ? You can break those kind of curses. You can live a blessed life in Christ. You can leave the next generation set up for success set up to receive the blessings of God. You can't graft them into heaven, but you can sure as heck pave the way. So here's what I want you to do. If you would, would you stand to your feet for a moment? As we get ready to wrap up our time, dads, I want to give an invitation for you. Maybe you're a, a father in here and, and you would say, hey, I haven't been the best model for my kids. I want my kids to have a thriving relationship with Jesus, but, but I haven't been modeling that for them. Here's what I'd say. And you can't give away what you don't have. But God wants to meet you right where you're at. He wants to give you a fresh hope and a new start and a new life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed in this room, hey, if you're a dad in the room and you'd say, I want to model for my kids what withholding nothing from God looks like, would you just throw your hand up in the air? See those. Here's what I want to do for you. I want to pray a blessing over you. God, I love you so much. I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to deliver your word, your truth, your grace, your mercy. God, I pray for the men who have made the declaration that their desire is to model a life in Christ that holds nothing back. God, I ask you to give them strength. I ask you to surround them with other men of God on the same path for the same purpose to be light in dark places, to be the spiritual leader of their homes. I thank you that in you we have all that we need to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I want to give one more invitation. Hey, if you're in here this morning and you'd say, hey, I want to accept Jesus as the replacement of my sin, I just want you to say a prayer with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for standing in my place, for dying so that I could have life in you. I accept what you did for me on the cross. Thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, can we celebrate with those who made decisions today?